U.S. President Donald Trump said on August 9th that he received a beautiful three-page letter from North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. He's not happy with the testing. It's a very small testing that we did, but he wasn't happy with the testing. He put that in the letter. Meanwhile, North Korea's foreign ministry issued a statement on August 11th saying it won't talk with South Korea unless it immediately pulls out of the joint military exercises with the U.S. or provides a convincing reason. Amid North Korea's denunciations of South Korea, Kim has embarked on another round of letter diplomacy with his U.S. counterpart, indicating his willingness to resume talks. Trump tweeted details about Kim's letter, saying Kim apologized for repeated missile tests and wanted to resume negotiations as soon as the military exercises end. The letter has fueled speculation that working-level talks between North Korea and the U.S., which have been at a stalemate since the DMZ meeting in late June, could begin. On this week's Peace and Prosperity, we take a closer look at the motive behind the North's two-track strategy towards South Korea and the U.S., and discuss how Pyongyang and Washington should prepare for possible working-level talks. Hello and welcome to our program. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has sent another personal letter to U.S. President Donald Trump explaining why North Korea had been conducting missile tests. Is top-down diplomacy between Washington and Pyongyang back on track? Will there be working-level negotiations resuming soon? We'll examine all these issues on this week's Peace and Prosperity. For more in-depth analysis of these issues, we are joined by Dr. Kim Jina, Research Fellow at the Korea Institute for Defense Analysis. Welcome back to the studio. Thank you for having me today. Right, my first question regards the contrasting attitude of North Korea towards South Korea and the United States. To South Korea, North Korea has maintain very harsh criticism of the joint military exercises. On the other hand, toward the Trump administration of the United States, Chairman Kim Jong-un sent a personal letter which uh, President Trump described beautiful. Yes. What accounts for this two-track strategy of North Korea? Well, well, what's really interesting to see these days is foreign ministry is criticizing the South Korean government, not the United Front Department. Actually, uh, dealing with inter-Korean relations was the, the job of the United Front Department. Right, but right. it seems to me that foreign ministry is taking the lead in all this process because the, their priority is dealing with the uh, U.S. government, not South Korean government. But so I think it... We will continue to see sidelining uh, South Korea in this whole uh, dynamics. But actually, that's not entirely new in our history because back in 1990s, during the first nuclear crisis, well, actually, South Korea, South Korea was uh, neglected. Its role was neglected because North Korea was trying to reach out to the U.S. Department. Uh, State Department trying to have a negotiation directly, excluding South Korea from the whole from this whole dialogue. But I I don't think that's going to be a big problem here as long as we have close coordination between the U.S. and, and South Korea, because back in 1994 in Geneva, South Koreans were there having a close coordination and and communication with the representatives from Washington. So I think if that kind of uh, working relationship is alive, I I don't. Think Think they're going to be a big problem. Right. Um, but in his personal letter to President Donald Trump, uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un allegedly uh, said that, well, the missile tests are uh, for the military exercises. Does it mean that after the exercise is over, sometime in late August, then is there be any uh, reconciliatory attitude expressed by North Korea toward the United States? I think Chairman Kim wanted to smoothen the impact of the missile test by saying that we are not pleased with the situation mm -hmm. either. 
Uh, so uh, there was a message to President Trump that uh, it was a direct reaction to the joint military exercises. So after the joint military exercise, North Korea has no legitimate ground to continue missile test. Plus, President Trump mentioned and revealed the fact that uh, there was a promise from Pyongyang that it's going to uh, restart the negotiation in the future right after the joint military exercise. Because it was uh, known to the public, North, uh, that actually puts North Korea in a position to honor that promise, gave, uh, gave, uh, was, which was given to President uh, Trump. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I'm a little bit worried about the fact that North Korea actually uh, blew up the, the opportunity to have a minister-level meeting in uh, ARF. Mm -hmm. In, in Bangkok. Yes, for, it was right? the first time that uh, North Korea did not send foreign minister to ARF meeting uh, in 10 years. So I think uh, intentionally North Korea avoided that kind of high level contact, and which makes me a little bit worried about the possibility that North Korea may uh, want to choose the timing of the talk of its own choice. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we might have uh, some quiet time after this summer. Yeah, I think. We now turn to two experts in the United States to broaden our perspective on this issue. We have Mr. Lee dong -hyuk, Voice of America Korean Service Chief, and Dr. Patrick Cronin, Asia-Pacific Security Chair at the Hudson Institute. Hello to you both. Thanks so much for having me. OK. OK, uh, Mr. Lee, uh, US President Donald Trump sided with North Korea on South Korea U.S. joint military exercises, saying he has never liked it either. What is the intention behind his remarks? Okay, first of all, uh, thanks for having me. And uh, uh, the views expressed here are my own, and those are not uh, uh, views and uh, opinions of the uh, Voice of America or the U.S. Agency for Global Media or the U.S. government. So I'd like to make that clear first. Um, I think uh, what uh, uh, President Trump uh, said uh, sort of reflect two things. Uh, number one, uh, you know, the joint military exercises is one of the few concessions that the Trump can make uh, to uh, Kim Jong Un. Uh, remember, uh, right after the uh, uh, the first summit in in, in Singapore, uh, President Trump made a uh, sort of a big announcement uh, to scale back the joint exercises between uh, ROK and, and the U.S. Now, what is interesting is uh, he already scaled back the exercises. So whether he will agree to scale back the exercises further uh, remains to be seen, but um, he's clearly showing willingness uh, to do so. Uh, the other thing is um, um, it, it also sort of reflects uh, the way uh, Trump views uh, of the exercises and the alliance between Washington and Seoul uh, overall. Mr. Lee, I have a question. Um, actually, the way President Trump sees the joint military exercise between the U.S. and South Korea is not actually traditional. Do you think there is any uh, concerns in Washington about this uh, perhaps affecting the alliance overall? Uh, there are concerns among uh, former U.S. officials and members of Congress that the uh, alliance is uh, uh, weakening. And obviously, Trump's view of the alliance and the uh, uh, joint drills uh, are, are different uh, uh, from those of uh, his uh, predecessor. At the same time, Congress is making its own efforts uh, to keep the alliance strong. Um, with respect to Trump's comments uh, on the uh, joint drills, uh, Many former officials and the uh, again members of Congress uh, do not necessarily endorse uh, the view of uh, Trump. Uh, particularly, a military analyst believe the joint drills is the key part of the uh, alliance. So, for that reason, uh, they uh, somewhat harshly criticized 
uh, Trump for making those kind of comments. All right, Dr. Cronin, uh, North Korea's repeated weapon tests have put the spotlight on the country's missile technology. Is it safe to assume that the slower negotiations on denuclearization are the more advanced North Korea's missile program gets? Are you concerned about this possibility? Well, based on the past three decades, I think it's safe to assume that North Korea will continue to try to improve its arsenal of weapons, including missiles and nuclear weapons, regardless of what we negotiate or do. Now, hopefully, we can change that. And until we get a negotiated agreement with international safeguards that we can verify implementation of that agreement, I think we have to assume that North Korea is continuing to try to improve its military hardware. All right. Thank you for both uh, for your analysis. We'll get back to you again later. The projectiles North Korea has fired in its recent weapon test are new ones that have never been seen before. Here's more on the story. North Korea described the two projectiles it fired on August 10th from Hangyongnamdo province as a new weapons system and released its photographs. Experts say the North's new weapons appears to be new tactical surface-to-surface -surface missiles that are different from its existing weapon systems. Over the past three months, the regime has showcased three new weapons, including a KN-23 short-range ballistic missile, a new large-caliber multiple rocket launcher system, and a new tactical surface-to-surface -surface missile. Many experts agree that the new weapons indicate advances in North Korea's weapons technology. The KN-23, North Korean version of the Iskander, has a range of over 600 kilometers, an improvement from the Scud Sea's 500-kilometer range. What the North said it fired on July 31st, a new large-caliber multiple rocket launcher has a longer range than the existing multiple rocket launcher and features precision guidance, which brings advantages such as greater destructive power and accuracy. The projectiles launched on August 10th were shorter in length and larger in diameter than the KN-23. The weapon showed similar traits to the U.S. Army's tactical missile system known as ATACMS. Just like ATACMS, it is presumed to contain a cluster munition warhead which ejects hundreds of explosive bombs that can blanket an area the size of four football fields. In the meantime, the South Korean government showed confidence about Seoul's ability to defend against North Korea's new weapons. The latest version of the Patriot missile, Pac-3 MSC, which has been deployed by U.S. forces in South Korea, is reportedly capable of intercepting Iskander missiles performing evasive maneuvers. Starting next year, the South Korean military also plans to deploy the Chungung Block 2, a medium-range surface-to-air missile used for intercepting ballistic missiles. So, Dr. Kim, Seoul is already within the range of uh, short-range missile attacks by North Korea, mm -hmm. um, but uh, Seoul has been responding to the concerned public that South Korea's missile capability is far more advanced than that of North Korea. So, do you agree with this assessment? Yes, I think uh, so, uh, South Korea actually has a short-range ballistic missile, and according to the current missile guideline between South Korea and the U.S., South Korea can have an extended range of the missiles up to 800 kilometers. 800 kilometers. Yes, yeah. and there is no cap on uh, the payload, so mm -hmm. South Korea can continue developing its uh, missile system. But I'm a little bit concerned about the current uh, missile defense system, indeed, because North Korea recently mentioned that the new uh, uh, missile system has a uh, low-level flight mm -hmm. and um, course correction capability is, and also the precision guided technology. So uh, that means if North Korea's new missile flies as a uh, at an altitude between 40 kilometers and uh, and 50 kilometers, then that can exploit the current uh, South Korea's missile defense system because uh, the Patriot can intercept an incoming target at an altitude of 40 kilometers, whereas that can have uh, an, an engagement floor up to uh, 50, uh, 
around around 50 kilometers. So there is a gap in our system. Like uh, altitude between 40 kilometers right. and 50 kilometers. Right? Yes. And if uh, the new missile from North Korea can maneuver freely after the boosting phase, then it becomes hard for the South Korean military to uh, calculate exactly the, the interception point. If the speed is like a supersonic, it uh, comes, uh, becomes a bigger problem for the South Korean military. So we have to work more on our missile defense system. I see. Uh, it must be a very difficult challenge yes. for South Korea. Uh, let's turn back to the working level negotiations between North Korea and the United States. If working level negotiations will indeed take place, what will be the main agendas? I think the first thing that they can uh, negotiate is having a very stable communication channels like a liaison office in order to have sustainability of this talk between the two sides. But if there is no strategic decision made by the leadership in Pyongyang, I think they cannot make a, a substantive progress in this dialogue because everything can be superficial. Mm -hmm. And I think the first thing that uh, the North Korean leadership have to do is is to decide what, what kind of uh, denuclearization roadmap should, should look like in the future. And other things like uh, the improving relations between the US and the DPRK can be the one, especially uh, the issues about the security guarantee to be provided to the leadership in Pyongyang. And another thing is the timing of lifting sanctions in the future. We are not going to talk about uh, sanctions lifting at this point, but we have to talk about the timing of lifting sanctions to provide some incentives to the, the negotiators from Pyongyang. Okay, there will be a lot of uh, agendas that will be on the table uh, yes. for the working level negotiations once it, uh, they take place. Now we get back to our experts in the United States. Hello? Yes, I'm here, yes. Mr. Lee, since you're in Washington DC, this question is for you. There are reports that Stephen Began, U.S. Special Representative for North Korea, is President Trump's top choice for the next U.S. Ambassador to Russia. Is this highly likely? If so, then who would be his replacement? Uh, I would say it's uh, too early to tell, and uh, it's a little bit uh, difficult to speculate right now. And uh, uh, if those reports are true, uh, you know, that means that the U.S. Uh, should, um, you know, shuffle uh, its uh, uh, negotiating, uh, nuclear negotiating team. Um, so it would mean some changes on the U.S. part. Well, uh, remember, there has not been much progress um, under the, let's say, leadership of uh, Steve Biggin uh, with North Korea. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't expect, I, I mean, I would say that there should be some changes, but I uh, would not expect major changes in terms of strategies or uh, approach. Um, what about you, Dr. Cronin? How will a possible change uh, would be uh, regarding Washington's top negotiating you know, team affecting the future working level talks between United States and North Korea? Well. The negotiations with North Korea have uh, essentially been commandeered by the top leaders. So President Moon, President Trump, Chairman Kim are all really the top negotiators in this. And I don't expect any of them to change immediately in the near future. Now, if someone like Secretary Pompeo were to decide to run for the Senate for his state of Kansas uh, in the coming months, yes, there will be a new Secretary of State. But Stephen Began is the special representative for North Korea, and I don't expect Stephen to be leaving anytime soon. He is getting ready, in fact, I think, to resume mid-level official discussions here in the coming weeks. Um, if there is a, a working level talks uh, resuming in, in the future, what kind of offer should Washington and Pyongyang uh, exchange on both sides? Um, the economic sanctions relief obviously continues to be a priority for North Korea. They would like to see those sanctions eliminated. They want to see economic money, you know, resources flowing into North Korea. Um, and I think that the whole idea of a brighter future plan for North Korea is if they denuclearize, if they move in that direction, they can start to realize some of the benefits of economic normalization. The specifics of this have to be worked out in detail and in private. Uh, and then raised uh, carefully between 
South Korea and the United States, are, the allies have to be coordinating on this very closely. Whatever we are saying to North Korea, whatever South Korea is saying to North Korea, we have to make sure that it doesn't weaken our own positions in Seoul and Washington. Um, and um, I think we can offer North Korea some security assurances, some assistance, um, but that assistance has to be calibrated to the significance of the step that North Korea is taking toward denuclearization. I see. Uh, my last question goes to both of you. Considering where things are going now, do you expect to see another Kim Trump summit meeting happening within this year? Why or why not? Well, I think more interesting question would be uh, not the timing of uh, when the you know uh, Trump Kim summit might be. Uh, I think here the sequence is maybe more important. Um, Washington uh, prefers uh, to have uh, a working level talks before another uh, Trump Kim summit, uh, whereas Pyongyang has been seeking uh, you know another summit, and it's a part of their strategy uh, to have a, a summit between Trump and Kim while trying to avoid working level talks as much as possible. So it remains to be seen uh, whether uh, U.S. will allow another summit before working level talks, as North Korea has been uh, demanding. Mm, I see. There will be a fourth summit meeting between Kim and Trump sometime, probably by the end of this year, early 2020. The reason for that is twofold. <laughs> First, if the official talks that are expected to get underway again succeed, then the whole idea is to negotiate a preparatory agreement that the two leaders could agree to formally at a summit. If, on the other hand, and maybe this is the more likely scenario, the mid-level talks break down yet again and we end up with another stalemate, at some point, the two leaders are going to want to break that stalemate. And so we see this letter writing exchange and we see this um, maintenance of a very close relationship between Kim and Trump. I mean, it's a fictitious relationship, but let's just pretend it's real. The point is that they want that fiction to continue. They want that relationship to, to look like it's very close. Um, and they will step in because they've invested a lot in trying to transform this relationship. So I, I expect there will be a fourth summit meeting between Kim and Trump in the coming months. All right, Mr. Lee, Dr. Cronin, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks. Well, Dr. Kim, uh, what's your take on these experts' assessment of the situation? I agree on many points, uh, especially about the timing of the, the talk between the DPRK and the U.S. I hope, I personally hope that it'll happen um, before to, uh, 2020, uh, before the end of this, this year, uh, because Kim Jong Un, Chairman Kim, actually uh, vowed to revitalize its economy, and such as uh, restarting the Gingang Mountain tourism and, and opening up the Yongbyon facility. Uh, sorry, opening up the the Gaesong in, indust, industrial complex, and etc. Uh, but it seems to me uh, those promises are becoming an empty promise because of the sanctions regime in place on the, the North Korean regime. So I think it's, it's best for South, uh, South Korea in North Korea to work more on, on dialogue, especially on denuclearization. And uh, the North Korean leadership should work more on its, uh, its negotiation with the, the U.S. counterpart before the end of this year, because the, the, the target year for accomplishing its economic plan is 2020. So there should be some urgency, I think, felt by the North Korean leadership as well. Right. Um, in conjunction with the possible you know, North Korea-U.S. negotiations cracking up, then what do you think of the role of Seoul in the future down the road? I mean, would it be more role or less role? Well, uh, first of all, I think South Korea should uh, work on close coordination between Washington and Seoul. That's, the, that's, that's good for our national security because we cannot uh, give North Korea any opportunity to drive a wedge between the two allies. Second of all, I think uh, it is really important to uh, continue providing some conditions for having a dialogue between the two sides, the U.S. and, and the DPRK. For example, President Trump could, met, 
could uh, meet uh, Chairman Kim in JSA just because we de uh, demilitarized that area based on uh, military CBN between the two Koreas. Lastly, I would like to emphasize that we have to work on uh, preparing um, uh, denuclearization roadmap, especially in a multilateral framework, such as the CTR, Comprehensive Threat Reduction uh, Program, which was once called as a non luger program, because it is very important to work on prepara preparations to, uh, to assist denuclearization process given to North Korea, because North Korea may need money uh, and technology and, and uh, the manpower as well. So we have to uh, think about the possibility that the U.S. government cannot just bear the burden. It has to be uh, decided multilaterally, and, and we have shared, to prepare. Right? Yes, we have to prepare right. for that. Right. All right, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your insights. Thank you for having me today. There has been a lot of news reports about recent developments on the Korean Peninsula. Here are the latest news updates. North Korea's latest missile tests are a clear sign of the regime's upgraded attack capabilities. This is according to the Washington Post, which on Thursday quoted various defense experts who raised concern about the regime's test firing of short-range missiles over the last four months. The launches included at least two new types of ballistic missiles, including the Rode Mobile KN-23. According to the Post, these missiles appear to threaten South Korea's missile defense system, with the missile fired last Tuesday flying at least 450 kilometers. Pyongyang said its missile test last Saturday included a new weapon that was different from previous weapon systems, but did not specify what it was. Observers say it's too soon to be certain about the latest weapon, but what's for sure is that the recent series of missile tests not only demonstrate the North's intentions to boost its military capabilities, but also help bolster Kim Jong-un's reputation at home as a powerful leader. We will come back to you to examine all these issues next week. And this is all we have for you today. Thanks for watching.